Okay, in part three of our notes for section 2.3, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, a limit theorem that is really not one that we're going to use a lot of, but I do want to introduce it because you might see a multiple choice question or two about it on the AP exam. And that is a theorem called the Sandwich Theorem, also known as the Squeeze Theorem. Now, basically what it says with the Sandwich Theorem is the idea that you're going to have a function f of x that you're interested in finding the limit for. And that function, f of x, is going to be squeezed or sandwiched in between two other functions. So if you know that f of x is sandwiched in between g and h for all x, except for we don't really possibly care what's happening at x equal to c. Again, that goes back to our idea that the limit, we only care what happens before and after c as we approach c, but we don't care what's really happening at c. So as long as the function f is sandwiched in between g and h everywhere close to x equal to a, then what we can do is then we can calculate the limit for f if we know that the limits for g and h both end up being l. So the idea is, you know, kind of a little short picture of it, kind of this what we call the, the sandwiching part of it is, is if I had a graph and somewhere you have this function f of x, say we're interested at this c value here. So f of f comes along and kind of does this. And maybe it has a hole there so we can't directly find the limit as x approaches c for this function. But we have two, well, usually what we consider to be nicer functions that sandwich f of x. And usually what happens is maybe here is going to be our uh, top function, which is h of x. And it doesn't really matter what it's doing out here. Here's going to be your bottom function, g of x. And the idea is, is that they kind of squeeze together right here. Now I've kind of exaggerated to show one on top, but you kind of have to assume that these two functions kind of squeeze together and they're at this value L over here. They do not have to be defined. They could both have holes in that location as well or it could be defined. doesn't really matter because we don't care what's really happening at C. All we care about is that we know their limits. And so the limit uh, as X approaches C for both G and H is going to end up being this L because they're kind of squeezing together right here. And the idea of the sandwich theorem is simply says that, hey, if I know the top one and the bottom one have the same limit, if they squeeze together, that's the squeeze part of it, they have the same limit, then what you're going to be doing here is saying, hey, if they squeeze together, that's the squeeze part right here, then I also know the limit of the function in the middle because it's squeezed by that and has to be heading to the same location because the others are forcing it to go there. Okay, so that's kind of this idea, like they're down here in this, if you'll read through the paragraph down here, is the idea that you have all these concert goers and they're in this 20,000 seat stadium. They're all going to leave, and if they leave through one single turnstile, no matter where they are, they have to squeeze together at that point in order to get out, and then they can spread back out again. It doesn't really matter what happens before or after, but they're squeezed into that one point to get out. So you pretty much know what that point is going to be. Here's another example of some functions that you're looking at. Uh, and this might be re a reminder of yourself that, you know, if we have a graph, um, which I'm looking at f of x equals x squared sine of 1 over x. This x squared out here, if you recall, is an idea that's like a damping factor. It's like a um, function that controls the amplitude of the sine graph. And then we've already seen sine of 1 over x. We kind of talked about that, that the closer you get to 0, the more often it oscillates. So we couldn't exactly, if we were trying to find the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine of 1 over x, we couldn't find this using the product uh, rule for limits because the limit of sine of 1 over x as x goes to 0 doesn't exist because of that oscillating uh, nature that it has close to 0. So basically, we can't just apply the limit properties and calculate what it is. But that does not mean that the limit does not exist. We have to kind of go to alternate methods uh, that we're looking at. 
um, and, and just kind of as a reminder to you that all those limit properties that I stated earlier in the first part, those limit properties had the condition that the limit of a product is the product of a limit provided those limits exist. However, it does not say that if the limits do not exist, that it's do not exist. You have to do extra work when you get that case. All right, so we have this damping factor, which is basically giving you the boundary curves for the oscillating function. So here's your damping factor. Here's your oscillating function. And it oscillates in between x squared and negative x squared. Because think about your boundary curves. Your amplitude is always the plus and the minus. So that's why I have this x squared and this negative x squared. And so it bounces in between as it comes in here. And when it gets into here, it's got a hole on this graph. Okay. And because of the damping factor, you're like, well, in the sine of 1 over x, it actually oscillated more and more and more. It never actually settled down. But what happens now is because of the damping factor that it's damped close to 0, even though it's oscillating more and more to zero, because the amplitude's getting less and less and less, it is going to have that actual limit as x goes to zero of zero. And the idea is, is that if you can find the top function and the bottom function that it's sandwiched in between, and we know their limits, they're very easy to calculate. The limit as x approaches zero of x squared is zero, because that's a continuous function. The limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared is also 0, because that's a continuous function. These are easy to find, and then as long as you are positive that they sandwich the one that you're trying to find in between them at 0, then you can know what the, what the actual limit is as x approaches 0, even though we cannot use the limit property that this is the limit of as x goes to 0 of x squared times the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x, that this is a problem because this does not exist. And you can't also go with the idea that 0 times does not exist is 0 because it may end up being does not exist. You, ha you can't follow those kind of rules there. You have to go to something else, something beyond, which is the sandwich theorem. And so it's this idea that you have to think of your top function and your bottom function are the bread, and the function you're actually trying to find the limit of has to be sandwiched in between them, and it's the salami. And, and I will tell you, it is fairly difficult to come up with those functions. Now, in the example that I gave you, I was using the knowledge, if you're, especially if you were in the plus class last year, you, we learned about the damping factors and how they affect the graph. And a lot of times you can kind of guess what they are from that. You can also guess what they are from some manipulations that we've done. We actually already did this one um, in an earlier example. And find the limit as x approaches 0 of tangent of x over x. Now we originally did this, we started doing some manipulations of it. We changed tangent into sine over cosine. That allowed us to split this into sine of x over x, 1 over cosine of x. And then what that allowed us to do is then do the product, because both of these limits would have existed, and we got 1. But notice that, and this is something that doesn't always happen, but it's something that, you know, they noticed in this one, is that the two functions, 1 over cosine of x that you found here, and the function sine of x over x, which is down here at the bottom, sandwiches the original function, tangent of x over x, in between them. And so another way of looking about at this is we could have actually calculated the limit for 1 over cosine of x, the limit for sine of x over x. They're both equal to 1, which means the tangent of x over x also had to have it equal to 1. Now generally, they're not really going to ask you in a lot of cases to just magically come up with these top and bottom functions on your own. But what you are going to be able to do is like, take some given information and use that to help determine a limit. Like for example here, this is probably one of the easier examples that you'll see, but they kind of come along, they give you some inequality. And the idea is, it's what they're giving you here, this is your sandwich. So they're giving you the top function and they're giving you the bottom function. And the idea is, is that what you want to see is you want to see, we're doing the limit as x approaches negative 1, we want to see on the graph that the graphs of negative 3x and the graph of x squared plus x plus 3 
kind of sandwiched together at negative 1. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the graph and I'm going to pull them up on my calculator. So you go ahead and graph them on your calculator so we can take a look at it. Okay, so you've inputted your negative 3x and your x squared plus x plus 3 into your calculator. Now notice what I've done in my window. I went ahead and zoomed in because you don't really care what happens far away from x equal to negative 1. We only care what's happening close to x equal to negative 1. And so basically what we're saying here is, notice I went negative 2 to 0. So right here is my negative 1 in the middle here. And then my y, I just adjusted that to kind of see the picture. So I have this picture here that we're looking at. And the g of x that we're going to be looking at, let me change over so I can draw on this, g of x falls in between. So g of x, I don't know what it is, but it's going to be somewhere in here. It may or may not be defined right there and then continue on. Because all we know is that it's somewhere in between the two. It can even, when we're looking at it, kind of go, oh, I'm having one of those. Okay, sorry, I had a little technical difficulty there, so I think I have it figured out. So I pulled the picture that we were looking at over here, and it says that the function g is in between but could be equal to it. So it could be bouncing along in here wherever it wants to, but it has to stay in between or equal to it. And you can see from the picture that right here at negative 1, it is being squeezed or sandwiched in between negative 3x and x squared plus x plus 3. And basically what the theorem says, if I want to find this limit, then all I have to do is check and make sure that the limit of the two pieces of bread, the bottom function and the bottom top and the bottom function are exactly the same, that they sandwich together. So I look at the limit as x approaches negative 1 of my negative 3x and direct substitution because we have a nice uh, function. This is going to end up just being 3. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of the top function, x squared plus x plus 3, again polynomial, so I can just do direct substitution, is going to end up being 1 plus negative 1 plus 3, or 3. So they are sandwiched together, and they have a value of 3 right here for their limits. So by the sandwich theorem, we get to conclude this limit is also 3. And that's essentially where you're going to be using and how you're going to be using the sandwich theorem. We'll practice some with that in class, and that will end our little short part 3 of the limit properties for section 2.3.